Good afternoon. Good morning. Good morning. How are you doing? I'm doing good. How are you? Good. Great. My name is Velma Nanka Bruce. This is the uh, San Antonio African American Community Archive and Museum Oral History Project. Uh, we're recording at the Carver Branch Library, which was designed by Norcell Haywood. And uh, today is Saturday, October the 12th, 2019. It's about 11.15 or so in the morning. And we're at the Carver Branch Library, 3350 East Commerce Street, San Antonio. So today we have Mr. Uh, Porter Dillard here. Thank you for coming today, Mr. Dillard. And if you would please start by telling us your name and your birthday. Okay, my name is Porter Dillard. Uh, my birth date is uh, September 24th, 1951. So I've got a few years on it. <laughs> and were you born in San Antonio? No, I wasn't. I was born in Detroit, Michigan, born and raised in Detroit, Michigan. Okay, wonderful. Alrighty. So how long have you lived in San Antonio? I've been in San Antonio since uh, 1977. Okay, what brought you here? Well, as I finished my uh, school background, school training, uh, went to architecture school at Howard University. When I finished that, I went to urban planning at the University of Michigan. And after graduating, uh, getting married. Um, my wife was in the military and the only place, and I wanted to be in Texas, but the only place they could place her was Fort Hood, Fort Sam, El Paso. And I said, well, look, see if you can get assigned to San Antonio. But I didn't think I wanted to try to get an architecture in Fort Hood. And I didn't think there was much opportunity in El Paso as well. So they were able to reassign her to San Antonio with the intention of her finishing up her tour and then we moved to Houston. But we came to San Antonio and that was in 1977. Wonderful. So you mentioned you wanted to come to Texas. Was there any particular reason you wanted Texas? It, yes, it was. Uh, at the time, as I was finishing up school at the University of Michigan, it was during the, uh, let's say, the, the, the slow days on economics in the Detroit area. I mean, much more than what it is now. The auto industries were uh, pretty much down, and the economy was uh, pretty much in the tank in the Michigan, Detroit area. And I had an opportunity as I worked during my years at, while I was in uh, graduate school to come to Texas as I was uh, with a firm that we were doing new towns. And we were working with a firm in Houston. So I came down one week to visit with the firm in Houston we were working with as we were designing new towns for Saudi Arabia. And that experience just put it on my radar. This is where I want to be. So when I graduated, the intention was to go to Texas, and that was the motivation. Wonderful, wonderful. So I understood, Stan, that you worked with uh, Mr. Norsell Haywood. Yes, I did. Right. Uh, Tell us about Norsell. <laughs> As the previous speaker and speakers have mentioned, um, there's a lot to tell about Norcell. I mean, he was a cantankerous soul. And having spent from 1977 to 1993 working in his firm, uh, without a doubt, there was a lot I learned from Norcell. And I was, I was so blessed to have had that experience of having worked with Norcell. I think as one of the previous speakers mentioned, uh, Norcell can turn you 10 different ways uh, and you can experience all manner of um, angst as you uh, would get to know Norcell. It's, it's so true. He, he, he was a gifted individual and, and before I get too far into it, um, as knowing him for the times that we were um, practice together. Uh, let me just delve back on what had me work with Norcell, what got me to Norcell. I think as one of the previous speakers mentioned uh, his knowledge of Norcell and he happens to be a frat brother of mine, current brother, alpha fraternity. <coughs> Norcell is an alpha as well as um, nothing to take away from my other brother that's here who's uh, one, of, one of our friend fraternities. But um, we were all alphas, and I became, uh, when I was looking to move to Texas after getting assigned in San Antonio, uh, my father is an alpha, and 
he was active with the fraternity and he knew of a member here, Mr. William <coughs> Smedler, who was an alpha. And he interceded with Mr. Smedler to ask, look, my son's moving, looking to move to Texas, are there any architects? And he said, yeah, we got an alpha brother who's an architect in San Antonio, North South Haywood. With that, I was able to have a contact when moving down here uh, to progress into um, uh, my, my profession for architect. But going back to uh, North Cell and his um, impact and what he's about, it, I, I really have to kind of bring into what I understand as some of his development as well. And having been in his office with him and, and meeting some of the people that he interacted with, North Cell was from Bastrop, Texas, which is at the time, back in the 30s, was a, probably a relatively small farming community, a small ranching community, uh, not too far from Austin. I think he subsequently, his family may have moved to Austin where he did his growth and development. And having been in Austin and I, his, um, I guess, uh, experience in architecture could not have been very much but he went into the architecture uh, area of study. He started out at uh, Prairie View A&M, and it was at a time when University of Texas, which was his intention, was not accepting blacks. So he and, a, he and about four others uh, were, I guess, some of the initial blacks that went to the University of Texas. He was the second in architecture to go to the University of Texas. Uh, the first was a black architect named John Chase. Uh, North Cell was the second, the second to graduate, let me put it like that. He was the first enrolled, but he was the second to graduate from the University of Texas. And as he had that opportunity to go to the university, um, he, when he graduated, he went and worked with the city of Austin in their planning department. Uh, during some time period along with that, and the item, the thing that got him to San Antonio, he was uh, uh, interacted with a, I'm gonna say a world-known architect out of San Antonio, O'Neill Ford. O'Neill Ford is known throughout the world for his, his uh, attention to architecture where it fits in with what they call the Southwest style. And he had a large firm, still has one, it's called Ford Powell Carson now, which is a very large architectural practice here in San Antonio. Uh, Mr. Ford uh, happened upon North Cell, and as a result of it, he employed North Cell into his firm. And I'm without a doubt sure that North Cell was the first African American that Mr. Ford incorporated into his firm. And as uh, Mr. Ford seemed to have had a uh, kind of cantankerous spirit as well, that um, you know looked at different things, and, and and it shows in his architecture, which is throughout the city of San Antonio, and, and a very heavy influence on North South. I mean, you can even see it in the building we're in right now. Not to mention Second Baptist Church. Um, O'Neill Ford was a major user of uh, the Mexican brick. And that is something that you will see in a lot of buildings here in San Antonio. And a lot of those buildings were even done by no Hill Ford or those who were predecessors or came out of this time. Uh, but to the extent that North Cell had his first start with O'Neill Ford, it then led to North Cell joining Second Baptist Church with his family. And as a result, Second Baptist Church, which was originally located close to where the uh, I-37 highway is. Well, when the highway was coming through, it displaced the church. So the church was bought out by the highway department. And they were able to arrange for acquiring the property that it sits on right now, which actually included the library, as well as the building next door, which at the time was a park. And North Cell being in the firm of uh, O'Neill Ford, the church went to O'Neill Ford to get have the uh, new church built and design. And O'Neill Ford had North Cell as the lead architect on designing the church. And as a result of that, he was able to 
develop his his notoriety uh, as an architect, and then that led to him being able to spin off and start his own form, which firm, which was North Cell Haywood and Associates. He then subsequently built his own residence, which is just off W. W. White and uh, the Rigsby uh, Rigsby Road area, and he also used the Mexican brick, Spanish style. And as he built his house, um, uh, it led to other commissions. And it was probably at a time when, in the 70s, early 70s, uh, that the, uh, the whole idea of, uh, of uh, integration of, um, and, and spreading out the uh, projects for minorities was starting to come into vogue. And as a result, Norcell Haywood, with his firm just opening up, was commissioned with doing several other public projects, one of them being the Claude Black Center, which was designed by North South Haywood. And that was a city commission that he received. Um, subsequent to that, this library, the Carver Library, which was a city project that the city gave to North South. And he designed the library. And I have to take uh, appreciation to what Carl had mentioned uh, of the building kind of reflecting what he remembered as a youth growing up. Well, one other thing that came about was the addition. We're in the addition part right now. And I was with North Sales Firm, and this was my project in North Sales Firm, was the library. And the addition we put on is actually the back portion there, that was the back of the library, the original library and the portion just in front of the reception desk, is, that was the front portion. Our task was to add on the two wings that you see on the front and this portion on the back all the way across. And I guess I take uh, appreciation to Carl's comments that it reflects the character or, or it looks like uh, the same building that he remembered growing up because when he was here, it was only the one portion. We didn't add this on until the 90s. And what he is actually saying is that the character of the building reflects such that it looks like one whole and has always been that, that building. And that's a testament to North Cell's approach to architecture. He always felt that you don't necessarily, when you're doing an addition, particularly, you don't necessarily try to create a, uh, a monument to yourself that kind of takes away from the original product of the original building try to make it blend in. And that's exactly what he's able to achieve with the way we added two additions on. And I have to admit, uh, one of his staunch, uh, North Cell staunch uh, ideas and premises was that when you're doing architecture, you let architecture, the design of whatever you create, you let it expand time. You let it he let it establish itself where even over time it can still sustain its character and appreciation for the way it looks whether it's the day after it's built or 100, 200 years from now and that's what he's able to achieve with much of his architecture uh, just going through some of the projects that Marcel has been involved with uh, as I mentioned Second Baptist Church which was probably his first project. And it was very impressive, and I, I'm gonna say impressive for, for me when I first moved here. I mean, I grew up in a, in a city where there were quite a few African American and quite a few churches in Detroit. But this was the first one I had seen where it was a monumental church built for an African congregation, African American congregation at the size and stature that it is. Uh, I've never run across any from the ground up churches built for African American congregations that would have been a brand new church for them of the size that we have here. Most times it would have been a previous church that was another congregation that uh, was held there and they just moved out of that community and sold it to that African American church body. And that's in most major cities throughout the country. 
But at that time, this was the first where he saw a, I want to say a cathedral, monumental type uh, church structure that was built for the African American uh, congregation that was there. The other church that Norcell built, and he built quite a few churches uh, around, the, around the state, uh, Antioch Baptist Church, that was nor one of Norcell's commissions. Uh, up in the Dallas area, he did the uh, Cornerstone Baptist Church out in South Dallas. He also did the uh, Golden Gate Baptist Church up in Dallas. And uh, there was the Masonic Lodge, Masonic Hall, up in the uh, Fort Worth area that Russell did. But being in his office and uh, working with him on a number of the projects, it was truly a uh, rewarding experience and it's been extremely beneficial for me as for the 17 years I worked with Russell and then went on to uh, 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 take in uh, uh, employment with City Public Service and running their facilities. Uh, and after retiring from that, I went and opened up my own firm. But the influence that Norcell gave me uh, was uh, something that has enabled me to open up my own firm and flourish. And, and let me digress just for a second because uh, I'm gonna say for anyone who may be taking part in the, uh, the, uh, the archives, being a African American that's been in the practice of architecture, it allows me an opportunity to reflect on some of the challenges that confront African Americans. And without a doubt, for uh, Norcell, as he was able to establish his own firm as an African American, and you to give you a little background, at the time in the, I'm gonna say the early 70s when he established his firm, there were probably, let's say, maybe a dozen African Americans who were architects throughout the state of Texas. Maybe a hundred or so African Americans who were architects throughout the nation. This is back in the 70s. And to be an architect, you have to be licensed. Uh, you have to pass the test. Do the, do the uh, study, go to, college get the architectural degree but then also uh, pass the, uh, the, the professional license test and as I said at the, during that, in that time in the 70s there were only a handful. Norcell was the first American architect in San Antonio and he was the only for a long period of time. Uh, I guess I may have been the second that was here in San Antonio. But as working with Norcell, uh, we were able to establish a number of things in terms of the work that we created and some of the buildings that we did. But just to go back to some of the other uh, other elements that Norcell was confronted with and uh, some of the challenges, and probably some of the things that helped mold his, uh, I'm gonna say his character and his attitude. Architecture itself is not a profession that lends itself uh, very much to, uh, let's say, low income strata areas. Uh, money for fees and exposure to those that have the money to pay or hire architects, they are generally relegated in a, uh, a higher economic area that particularly during that time, African Americans were not so much akin to. You know, things have changed now, but at that time there weren't many, weren't many opportunities. So as a result, as an African American, your opportunity to get commissions where you could sustain an office was primarily because of the government approach to engaging uh, minorities, uh, which was a part of the Johnson era effort engaging minorities to be a part of the process. And as a result, North was able to, to acquire a number of city projects that help keep them going, uh, as I'm doing right now myself. But during that time and as growing up and working in the practice of architecture, it was a challenge for an African American entity to be able to get the kind of commissions that would allow them to sustain an office and uh, to maintain uh, employment and all that and that type of thing. But going back to some of the other works that Marcel has been involved with, um, I can only go back to second uh, CPS building. 
For those who may know of the CPS building, which is located right here on San Antonio River, downtown, um, right by La Vieta. Well, the CPS building was uh, a redesign that North Cell firm, Hayward Jordan McCowan, was picked by CPS to do the architecture on it. And as being a part of the process and helping to uh, select that, it was one of those uh, works that um, brought about a tremendous opportunity in terms of raising fees. And it also propelled North Cell into, I guess, a category of providing architecture where it's upwards of, let's say, the $20 million project range, which back in the 80s, that was a good sized project. Uh, other things that we engaged in and other projects, North Cell was. Um, very active with uh, the UT Advisory Committee. And North Cell, as being a graduate of UT, he was one that was not shy about challenging uh, the, uh, the powers that be for getting his piece of pie. And in that regard, UT, as they were building the uh, UT Dallas campus up in Austin, or up in uh, Dallas, North Cell, uh, I guess he talked a lot with the uh, powers over the UT system and he was able to get the commission for the UT Dallas Student Union building which is on the campus of UT Dallas which was a significantly uh, outstanding building uh, and outstanding uh, size of a building at the time as they were just starting the uh, UT Dallas uh, uh, school up there in the Dallas area. Um, other things that I can credit him in uh, were some of the housing projects that uh, the firm was involved in. And a little anecdote on some of that. Uh, I recall we had, as a firm, we had done a renovation of a major housing project in the uh, Dallas area. So we had a pretty good track record on uh, renovating public housing, project housing, public project housing. That, from a city's uh, housing uh, department. Well, as a result, we had a, a pretty good, um, uh, I'm gonna say, uh, uh, dossier and, you know, list of works as we relate, photos and things of that nature. And there was a commission that was being offered up in a little small town, I'm not gonna say the name, but a little small town in the, uh, here in Central Texas where they were looking to do a renovation on their housing project. So as we turned in our information and photos, um, we were uh, asked to come up and interview for the project. Now needless to say, it was strictly photos of the project and the way we put it together. But when, when we went to that small community and sat before their board, the minute we stepped in the door and they saw who we were, uh, it was a complete transformation on their excitement to going through and delivering and having us do the presentation. As we set up our slides and gave the, the, the rollout of it, um, we were the only firm that had done that kind of a renovation, that magnitude of a renovation. And as we were selected based on the works, when we went up there to show our faces, we were completely disjointed from getting the commission because we were an African American uh, firm that was looking to do a service and had the only track record of having provided that service. But that's just the anecdote on some of the things that as an African American architect and as North Cell Haywood being a pioneer in the, uh, let's say the uh, delivery of African American uh, architectural services that he experienced. and. Uh, he, he led an effort that uh, helped out quite a few people. Um, as I mentioned about his uh, interaction with the UT uh, Advisory Committee and the president of UT back in the 90s, uh, I forgot the, uh, who the president's name was, but he helped forge a scholarship, uh, tran a scholarship effort through the University of Texas as well as was a leading element on the 10% uh, the uh, qualifier that the University of Texas put forth back in the 90s where 
the top 10% of any graduating class will be given an opportunity to come to the University of Texas, regardless of the class, such that it took away just uh, going to certain areas of the city. It was whatever 10%, whatever group or whatever people made that 10%, they would be accepted into the University of Texas. And North Cell was a very big proponent working uh, with the uh, president of uh, UT at the time to establish that. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't also talk about a couple of other, uh, say, noteworthy projects that North Cell uh, did the architecture on, one of them being the Carver Community Cultural Center. Uh, many of you may have been to the Carver at some time. A uh, little story on the Carver. As much as the Carver was, uh, at the time, as it was built as the, let's say, the colored library and the colored uh, community center. And, and literally, that, those words are on the entablature over the side doors into the Carver, where it's in, it's carved into the uh, stone uh, the edifice that's right over those doors, the colored library. But as that library was reaching, you know, a pretty, pretty uh, uh, aged uh, lifespan, well, back in the uh, late late seventies, the city was looking to tear down the car, and there were a number of community people from within the East Side community, the African American East Side community, as that was their main location for uh, uh, entertainment and uh, cultural act, uh, opportunities. Well, they fought the uh, city uh, effort. One lady even uh, laid down in front of the bulldozer to prevent that. And the Reverend Claude Black, who was over Mount Zion at the time, and North Side as an architect, uh, they were able to stop the bulldozers, and then they engaged North Cell Haywood to do the renovations on the carpet. That was the first renovation. The firm was subsequently handed another renovation opportunity a dozen or so years after that in which it transformed the Carver Auditorium into the theater characteristic as you see right now which literally was one of the uh, I'm going to say uh, well-known theaters in terms of its uh, acoustics appeal and in the process of creating that we actually went and solicited nationwide specialists in acoustics and lighting to kind of serve as consultants with us on that project. We also added on what became the, uh, I want to say the theater uh, uh, set production area, as well as a uh, dance studio that was added on to the cover at that time as well. But that was one of the other projects that was a, let me say, give that Marcel gave to the city of San Antonio, just his expression of how much he felt in terms of uh, making things work. Th there's a business side to North Cell as well, and an entrepreneurial side. I'm sure not many of you are familiar with St. Paul Square. St. Paul Square, as much as that area, I'm gonna say back in the early 70s, that was literally San Antonio's red light district. And the buildings were pretty much owned by a lot of African Americans, but as it being near the train station, it served also as kind of a, kind of a you know a, a, a negative area in terms of activities that were going on. Well, the city came and bought out all the buildings that you see in St. Paul Square right now, and as a result, they went back and did a redevelopment effort in which they engaged North Cell, along with O'Neill Ford, Ford Powell Carson, to develop a master plan for that whole area. And the two firms developed the master plan. And it was to create the, let's say, the higher end business and office characteristics, restaurants and things of that nature, as what you see right now. And, and so North Cell was a part of that master plan development that created St. Paul Square, which kind of helped spur on some of the other positive developments that you see with the Alamo Dome, as well as with the hotel and the uh, and the uh, um, the, the high-rise apartments and things of that nature. But Norcell's own entrepreneurial spirit was his effort to also buy for the buildings 
and he purchased and redeveloped four of the buildings in that St. Paul Square area. The buildings are the ones that are right there on the corner, just right opposite the, uh, the uh, train station there. And he incorporated, put in a nightclub in the building. It was called the, uh, the Bottom Line. That was kind of an old expression of North Cell that he would use in his interactions with people. You know, what's the bottom line? So he created a, a uh, nightclub there, a very uh, busy nightclub and a very active one that, uh, you know, served the city well. Not to mention the, four, the three other buildings that were there where he put in uh, offices and things of that nature. He engaged a couple of the Dallas Cowboys were investors with him on that. Uh, Drew Pearson, Harvey Martin, uh, that might be missing some of you all, but they were well known, so, some of the gray hair folks might remember those names. <laughs> they were well known cowboys, as the cowboys were the team of destiny and winning Super Bowls and everything else. But they were also investors on that project as well. But going on with uh, some of Norcell's uh, works and some of his other business activities, he always sought to try to develop an apartment complex, which he uh, went in and acquired the property. About a 10 acre tract right up at the uh, South Cross and uh, W.W. White, in which with his intention was to build uh, affordable apartments in that area. The, 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 he went through a lot of uh, challenges from the financial institutions and the project was never built, but that was one thing that through uh, his, I'm gonna say his final days and his profession practicing of architecture was one of the things that uh, was always still on his drawing board to try to achieve, but he never was able to finish that. But all in all, the, um, I can attest to my experience of having been working with Norcell and the things that he has, uh, I'm gonna say, uh, passed on to me in terms of approach to architecture, design, and how to deal with the, uh, deal with the, the, the system. And when I say system, deal with the powers that be when you're trying to get a project built. Um, he, he, he encouraged me and passed on to me a lot of traits that have been beneficial to me in my practice of architecture that uh, allowed for me to do some of the things that I do right now as well. Um, if there's anything else I could lay on this, <laughs> I know I'm missing some of his buildings. Uh, well, I was curious, I'd, certainly he did a lot for the African-American community. Are, are there uh, structures outside of the African-American community that he worked on? Uh, there are a number, as, as I mentioned, up in Dallas, there are a couple of churches, not to mention the UT Dallas uh, Student Union uh, in Austin. Uh, he worked with Ebenezer Baptist Church on the development of their, uh, uh, their community center, which is right there in the uh, Austin, um, 6th Street area, uh, East Austin. Uh, and we also did a very similar, I'm gonna say master plan development for the East Austin, I guess it was called Robertson Hill area as, as it was known, but it was the East Austin area of uh, 6th Street up to 11th Street from 35 up to uh, Chacon. That was a whole neighborhood that was kind of Austin's uh, east side African American community. And the city of Austin Redevelopment Authority engaged our firm to develop a similar master plan development, similar to what we had done with, uh, in San Antonio at, at St. Paul Square. And I have to attest that as you, if you've been up in Austin, you will see that that whole area has pretty much transformed to a tremendous, uh, I'm going to say residential, I'm, I'm just sorry to say that it's been a regentrified residential because the people that were previously there are no longer there. And uh, as the properties that they own have been acquired and the whole area has been re regentrified, it's taken that portion of the Austin area and pretty much really expanded it tremendously.
Well, usually that's the case if it's those areas that are closer to the downtown, to downtown. the business hubs. That I mean, are, we're experiencing it here. I mean, I can test to, uh, I guess, folks that might be familiar with the Dignity Hill or the Denver Heights area, which is starting to get its uh, the pressure put on the uh, property values that are creating some, you know, some issues within some of those areas as well. But um, that, and uh, if I was to count all the projects that he's been involved with, there have been hundreds. Um, as trying to recall some of those that stand out or that we may be familiar with, particularly here in San Antonio, um, the schools, um, Cameron Elementary School. Norcell did the uh, library as well as one of the classroom buildings. And then my firm, we were fortunate enough to come into the overall building just in the last couple of years. But Norcell did those initial buildings. And he did quite a bit with the uh, SAISD and through one of our, uh, I'm gonna say our passing uh, fellow uh, members who was on the school board at the time, uh, Tom Gaffney. Tom Gaffney, who just passed away, uh, he helped bring in African American participation on helping to create some of the schools here. Sam Houston High School, there were quite a few commissions that we did on Sam Houston High School, from the gymnasium complex to a couple of the new wings on Sam Houston. So that was something, the things that were done by Norcell's firm, and uh, I was a part of that. And getting some of the, uh, let's say, some of the influence from Norcell along giving back to the community or uh, being a part of the institutions that are within the community. Well, I participated quite a bit with Sam Houston, and um, it was part of the influence that I received from just that uh, interaction that I had with Norcell Haywood. He only, he died about two years ago, just a little over two years ago. He passed away. Sounds like he had quite a few contributions to San Antonio, and we were lucky to have him. Oh, uh, without a doubt, our, we were. We were. In our community. Yes. Well, that's, that's excellent. Well, I appreciate it today. Are there any other special things that you'd like to share with us about San Antonio or working with Norcell? Or? Well, um, there's a lot that I have. I do. I mean, as much as I mentioned my relocation from Michigan to San Antonio was because of Texas and the weather. And at the time, I was influenced by Austin or Houston. Well, the reason I stayed in San Antonio is because San Antonio offers much of the uh, the same opportunity that you would see in big cities, but without all the the major challenges that you know on the side that you get from the larger cities. And uh, at the time, and as San Antonio has grown since I've been here, and I've been here since 77. It's matriculated to the seventh largest city in the nation, and the trajectory is only up for San Antonio. So there's a lot here to offer, um, and it's the reason why, rather than moving on to Houston, that we decided to stay here in San Antonio. It's been tremendous for me, my family, my wife and kids, and they've been able to benefit tremendously from our experience here in San Antonio. Well, I thank you for your time today. Were there any questions from the group? I, I have a question. Yeah. I, I want to know, sir, and maybe you know as well in terms of Norcell, um, some of his early childhood background, and, and yourself too, what um, or who or is there an experience that influenced you to have to create a success mindset in in who you are today, as well as Marcel? Mm -hmm. Did you ever talk about that? Or, well, or? I'll try. I'll try to throw put out what I think may have been. I, I never did have a one-on-one -on -one conversation on what motivated him. As I mentioned, he uh, he, he was, I think, born and maybe some rearing in Bastrop area which was a small community, but did much of his, uh, I guess, his, uh, you know, growing up period in Austin, which 
you know, I would say back in the 30s and 40s, probably was a little more, uh, it was a, that definitely was a lot larger, but it was still relatively small community as uh, most cities go. And, and I bring that, I say that because influencing a person on architecture is generally uh, having visual connections with, let's say, uh, interesting things that relate to building types or whatever. That's generally, a, from my perspective, that's generally a, a major impact that kind of stimulates one's uh, interest in architecture. Uh, so North Cell's interest in architecture has grown up in Austin, may have been through some of the things that were being done in, our, in Austin at the time uh, that motivated him to want to go into architecture. But I'm sure his connection with an architect would have been extremely minimal, yeah. if at all. Uh, even mine, with an architect. I mean, I've grown up in Detroit, where you saw a lot of architecture. But uh, I, I, I did have an opportunity to meet an architect through my father, who knew one, an Anglo architect up in the Detroit area, who worked for the Housing Authority, and that was my only contact. But my interest in architecture. Actually, and, and I cited this in a uh, in a uh, uh, production in the Black Book. My interest in architecture grew out of uh, an experience I had in the fourth grade, and it was one of those uh, situations. And I quickly go through it. Being in grade school in a predominant African American community, the teacher was out, and as a result. The substitute just said, hey, just keep busy, keep quiet, you know, stay at your desk. So I took out the uh, pencil, paper, and a ruler and started drawing a house. It was a house that was being built in my neighborhood that I was, you know, brand new house that was being built in my neighborhood. So I was able to create such a likeness by the end of the class hour when uh, we were leaving, all the kids came by, all the classmates, and they just marveled at the likeness of the house. Now this is in the fourth grade, so you know, as using a ruler and you know the pencil and that, and it captured all the features. It kind of struck me at that time. Wow, this might be something worth pursuing. So from then, it went on to middle school and taking drafting, and then on to high school, where there was a uh, extensive architectural uh, curriculum in my high school, and then I went on to even work in an architectural office while I was in school. So that in itself kind of helped uh, develop my, let's say, appreciation of architecture, as well as my uh, focus um, on going into architecture. Uh, yeah. We spoke very briefly about, um, you know, St. Cam were situated at the Sutton family, the home, you know, the birthplace yes. of all the Suttons, all 15 kids. We, we spoke briefly about that, but I wanted to know, I know that you are the reason why we have the beautiful house that we have now where we're situated. So I wanted you to give us a little bit of information um, about that process, but then also um, just some of your backgrounds uh, working with the Suttons. I know you, you had to have met and worked with some of the Suttons at some point. So I just want to, you know, really get mm -hmm. your perspective from that that place. Well, uh, the house itself, the Sutton, the uh, say, the house she's mentioning is the Hope House, which is located on Cherry Street, which actually was the original home of the Sutton family. And for you all that might not be familiar with the Sutton family, the Sutton family is a um, what do I call it, a dynasty, or it's probably one of San Antonio's, uh, what do you call it, upper crust uh, African American political families. There was a large family of, uh, you know, kids born to the Sutton family, and they have been in tremendous leadership and they have applied their leadership in a number of things. One of them was the Manhattan Borough President, just like the mayor of Manhattan, Percy Sutton. And he was actually the uh, the lawyer that represented Malcolm X's uh, Malcolm X. That's correct. Yeah, but he moved when he grew up. After he became of age, finished his schooling, 
he moved to New York and he matriculated within the New York Harlem area to become the uh, Manhattan Borough President and uh, a very well-known leader, not to mention uh, his brother, uh, G.J. Sutton, who the building that was just recently torn down, which was the state office building, G.J. Sutton was one of the uh, first African-American uh, state representatives that represented the San Antonio area, and that was G.J. Sutton. And they've got a number of other Suttons, and doctors and lawyers and other capacities, but that's the family. And the house that they lived in was the Sutton House right there on Cherry Street. And it was a funeral home. They were in the funeral business. And as uh, the house was the birthplace of all the kids and everything, as it was converted to a funeral home, it was actually clad in uh, shaker shingles. And uh, I guess a, 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 a adequate design for when it was done, maybe in the 70s or, or 60s. But as that was a funeral home, the house was then, uh, the funeral was there, but then the funeral home moved out further out to uh, W.W. W. White area. And the house is just left there. And it's set there for um, many years, you know, with nothing going on. Um, I guess the one of the founders of SACAM, George Frederick, as he operates a nonprofit entity, saw the house and took upon himself to see about acquiring it and turning it into a uh, facility for uh, uh, helping out uh, uh, folks in homeless capacity. And it became Hope House. Now, George uh, interacted with uh, the Suttons. And, and I know several of the Suttons here and kind of encouraged George that, look, look, there's a tremendous history opportunity here just trying to get some of the Sutton memorabilia, so maybe trying to establish uh, something with the Suttons might be uh, worth pursuing as well. But uh, as George was looking to create the Hope House for doing the services that Hope House delivers, uh, the house itself, as he asked me to do the architecture, because it was in pretty rough shape, uh, and as it sits in the historic district, it's in the Dignity Hill Historic District, which mandates that, you know, if you're going to do some renovation or work on a house, you need to try to bring it back to its original character. So as he engaged my firm to uh, help do the renovations on it, we came in, got involved, took it before the Historical Commission, and uh, got the Historical Commission to kind of approve the designs that we were pursuing and how we were going to bring, pull off all the uh, cladding so that we could expose the house and even did the paint samples so that we can even replicate the original paint. That was what we went through in terms of getting the house and then getting the contract to do the building, which is what you see right now, right there, Cherry and Dawson Street. But it turned out well, and uh, it uh, it's a plus. So I think they're looking to expand even more. Questions? Yes sir. When do you plan to go to Egypt? <laughs> so, been. Oh no, I haven't been yet. You gotta go because you are the guy. Yeah. You are the ski on of that paradigm. Yeah. Yeah. So you need to take the queen and go. Uh, I, 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 I'd like to go. And and I'm gonna now that you put it on my radar, I'm gonna do the extra focus to see how we make it happen. Right. Well, thanks again for coming. Okay.